large scale agile transformations are always a journey and a roller coaster for everyone involved. Today's guest speaker will share a couple of powerful strategies useful for change agents in such environments. Jason Jip is an agile coach at Spotify in New York and was previously a principal consultant at ThoughtWorks. He's also been involved in the XP community since 1999. In other words, a lot of experience. If you're not already subscribing, make sure to do just that so that you don't miss any future brilliant guest talks. Jason, take it away. Thank you, Jimmy, and um, thank you, uh, whoever's watching, um, to listen to my talk on facilitating large-scale change. Uh, so these, these are the models and strategies I prefer. I'm not saying these are universal, uh, but um, these are the ones I like, and hopefully they're useful for other people. Uh, so here's the full list, uh, which I will go through. Uh, there are, what, eight of them, um, but I'll go through them relatively quickly. Uh, and then maybe we'll chat about this with uh, Jimmy after. The, the first idea is this idea of a simultaneous air and ground war, but it's mostly a ground war. Uh, this is a metaphor uh, that I uh, learned from a book called Scaling Up Excellence. Uh, the general idea of an air war means controlling narrative, uh, where narrative are things like inspirational speeches, videos, education sessions. This is kind of a typical uh, air war approach that large-scale change uh, uses, whereas ground war means influencing people uh, person by person. So having one-to-one -one dialogue um, with people you're trying to influence, modifying policies um, and changing systems. Um, that includes tools uh, as well as procedures. Uh, I think most people assume large-scale change is just an air war, and then they are surprised when they control the narrative um, and nothing actually changes. So they do all the marketing, uh, but none of the underlying uh, policies and tools and convincing people has happened, which means none of the behavior changes. A thing to remember when we are engaging in large-scale change is that our goal is not to change stories and symbols, uh, our goal is not even to change minds. And, and this is a kind of a common mistake I think people make where they, they worry a lot of maybe too much about mindset. The goal is to change behavior. So this is not to say that changing narrative or controlling narrative isn't useful. It is useful, but only as much as, much as it provides cover uh, to enable policy and system change uh, because policy and system change are really what enables behavior change. Again, this comes from a book, uh, the general idea comes from a book called Scaling Up Excellence by Bob Sutton and Huggy Rao. Um, I've modified it a bit based on how I interpret and use it, uh, but it's a good book to take a look at. Uh, the next strategy is one uh, called Simultaneous Coordinated and Opportunistic Change Strategies. Uh, and if I can't do both, I'll choose Coordinated. So. Ideally, if you had enough people, if you had enough influence, um, I like to do two simultaneous approaches. One that is highly coordinated, targeting high leverage initiatives, um, and you effectively uses uh, focus and directed power. Um, at the same time, to do something decentralized and grassroots, opportunistic, and enabling mass power. So an example of this uh, if you're thinking a large scale um, agile transformation, the uh, something high leverage could be targeting a specific a high impact delivery and making sure that high impact delivery is done well uh, and is successful. Uh, usually with that, it means that not everyone is involved. Uh, so you get um, sometimes you have politics associated with that and people have are kind of jealous of not being able to be a part of that initiative. But at the end of the day, you can produce a significant result for that organization, so it's useful. The second strategy of being more grassroots and opportunistic is to trying to address that uh, political aspect, getting people feeling involved, um, which is useful. I normally don't expect that second approach to produce um, impact, at least not in the short term. Uh, sometimes it does, so sometimes you can um, serendipitously or randomly uh, 
have something that has traction, but primarily it is just to uh, ensure people feel involved and in the long run, start to build up general capability. Uh, so that's why I have these things as two simultaneous things. I don't think, I uh, definitely would not do the second one though on its own, uh, which is what I meant by uh, if, if I had to choose between the two, I can only do one, I would choose the highly coordinated um, targeting a high leverage initiative approach uh, because that produces impact. The third strategy is uh, think like a commander. Um, I'll, t I'll talk about why um, it's called that, uh, but first I uh, wanna introduce this idea of the difference between a routine and adaptive expert. Uh, so a routine expert refers to someone who knows specific patterns and techniques that only work uh, within a particular context. Um, and within that particular context, you can't tell the difference between a routine and adaptive expert. Uh, but once you change the context, you'll notice the routine expert no longer is no longer successful where the adaptive expert um, just modifies patterns and techniques because they're really operating on underlying principles and concepts. The uh, general idea here is that um, knowing underlying principles and concepts and then deriving patterns and techniques is a better approach uh, to take. Um, and that's what the kind of expertise that you want to encourage. Uh, this comes from a uh, concept that um, I learned from the US Army, um, a report, a research report they did, and I modified it to uh, come up with cognitive themes for adaptive change agents. So these are themes that I think as a, a large scale uh, change agent, uh, these are things that you should keep in mind uh, to be effective and to be able to adapt to different contexts. The first one is to keep a focus on mission and higher intent, uh, which means it's not just what you're trying to change um, at the moment, but what are the broader and larger relevant goals uh, that initiated the change in the first place. The second is to model thinking participants. Uh, so even if you're seeking what you believe is a mutually beneficial outcome, you have to recognize that the other participants, uh, stakeholders in this situation are intelligent. They have their own motivations and their own strategies. They're all active. Uh, so it's not like uh, you're going to do this change, you do your thing, and everyone else is passive. They're also active and intelligent. Uh, considering the effects of terrain, um, which is a metaphor um, in this context that can refer to organizational and environmental structure and context. So you, you need to consider what else is going on um, in the organization. Um, the next thing is to use all assets available. Um, assets mean pre-existing skills and experiences, past case studies, pre-existing structures, processes, policy tools, et cetera. Um, any situation you go into where you're trying to initiate a change, it's, you're not starting from scratch. There's always something that you can use if you bother to, to look um, and you should use those things. Um, this next one I think is actually a big uh, gap and people tend to miss this a lot, um, including considerations of timing. So what are your timing constraints? What's the cost of delaying impact? This kind of relates back to my previous point of uh, preferring having impact earlier uh, rather than doing a longer term a kind of a mass change thing, uh, that's really associated with the idea of considering timing. Uh, how much time do you have to make an impact before you, or you'll start losing influence because you're taking too long? Um, also, some interventions, they're no longer relevant because the timing constraints of the context make them irrelevant. Uh, the next item, consider where your change fits into the bigger picture of what is happening. What are other changes and activities happening in the larger context? Um, and consider both friendly and non-friendly perspectives. Usually, even if you're saying, hey, I'm here to uh, cause a particular change, that's usually, especially with the larger organizations, that's usually not the only thing happening. There are other stuff occurring, uh, some things that are uh, supporting and some things that are competing. And these are all considerations that should be taken um, when you're looking at a large scale change. Uh, exhibit visualizations that are dynamic, proactive, and flexible. Uh, so, Mainly this is about the large scale change are tend to be complicated and difficult to process for people. So visual models help um, get that out of your head and enable other people uh, to participate. Um, even with change approaches that are poor, uh, 
just being good at visual models uh, tends to help with um, getting people to connect with them, even if they don't work. So that's just how powerful the visualizations are. Okay, and then finally show rich contingency thinking, um, thinking about what can go wrong, um, how you can mitigate, transfer, or accept that risk, um, just standard risk management type things. Um, especially with the large scale change, you should not expect it to be automatically successful and you should be prepared for things that will go wrong. Okay, as again mentioned, this came from, the idea came from this thing called Think Like a Commander Prototype uh, from the US Army Research Institute. Um, and I just modified it um, to, as a kind of useful idea for change agents. Uh, the next strategy is role model systems and symbols. This refers to three key uh, things to influence, uh, which is kind of like the idea of what are the primary things people uh, consider when they decide how they should behave. Uh, the first thing is role models. What are powerful, influential people doing? The second thing are systems. Uh, that is what's expected from roles, policies, and processes. And symbols. And this is about narrative. What's the story about how things work here? That's effectively the air war thing I mentioned before. So. Uh, when people decide how they should behave, they consider these three things. Uh, therefore, these are the things uh, that you should be trying to influence. Um, role models are pretty important. Uh, systems are, even though role models tend to influence things a lot, systems are just more prevalent. Uh, so role models aren't always, you know, like it's not constant exposure, where systems are almost like constant exposure. So those are worth doing. And symbols are the last thing. They're useful, but um, I wouldn't start there. And this is, again, ground war before air war. Um, because symbols are, if they're incongruent with role modeling and systems, they just end up being uh, seen as hypocritical and uh, trigger cynicism. Cynicism. So uh, symbols are, are kind of worse uh, if they're not, if they don't match role models and systems. So role models and systems should come first. Okay, yeah, so uh, here's just a little bit more about role modeling. Uh, role modeling, especially by influential, powerful people, tells everyone else what's considered acceptable. Uh, so if you have rules, but your influential people are breaking them and there's no consequences, people realize that those rules aren't real. Um, they're just kind of there. And that always happens with large places. You have rules that aren't enforced and it's just because people have an updated policy, uh, but they rely on looking at what influential people do to decide what's actually real. Um, same thing with things that role models do, do, do that aren't even written down. People just assume that those are hidden rules. Um, and yeah, there's a, this kind of last point. If, um, if you have role models can do things that no one else is allowed to do, uh, that makes a statement about the role of power um, in your organization. So you have to be careful about that. Um, systems, as mentioned, uh, structure, process, policies, um, they're ever present. Um, so uh, they have a pretty uh, high impact on reinforcing behavior um, uh, just because they're there all the time. And I mentioned before, the symbols trigger cynicism when they're incongruent, but um, they're useful when they are. Okay, so this a lot of this comes from a book called Systems Leadership, um, which was about structured uh, systems theory. Um, I, just this one concept, this is kind of the main thing I remember from this book, but it's worth uh, taking a look at as well. Okay, now kind of expanding on different sources of influence, because those are like three sources of influence on behavior. Um, if I expand on that, there's there's more. Uh, so um, like this model, six sources of influence comes from uh, the Vile Smarts, I think they're called Crucial Skills now. Um, so looking at motivation and ability across three levels, personal, social, and structural. Um, where personal motivation is what the individual wants, personal ability is what the individual knows how to do, social motivation is what friends, family, colleagues want the individual to do, social ability, what friends, family, colleagues can help the individual do, structural motivation is what incentives exist in the environment, and structural ability is what is easier or not easy to do in the environment. The general idea with six sources of an influence is you try to hit everything. So we try to approach, uh, do interventions that uh, affect all of these sources, um, not just one or two, even. You try to do them all. Um, there is a tendency for people to assume people behave based off of personal motivation only. This is known as the fundamental attribution error, and this is not actually true. Um, there are a lot of different 
uh, sources that you can influence. This also means that if you say, hey, I can't influence certain things and I'm stuck, well, no, you have other sources that you may be able to influence and you use those instead. So the idea is you're trying to outnumber the other sources and affect them. Right, so the best approach for high probability persistent behavior change is not we just need to change your thinking nor we just need to make the right thing easy to do, but rather as many sources of influence as you can affect. Um, best book for this is uh, a book called Influencer, um, which uh, talks about all these things in more detail. Okay, um, sort of related to this um, is this idea of changing systems and behavior to change mindset, not vice versa. So even though I said, hey, you want to change all of them, it's easier to change systems and behavior uh, to change mindset rather than the opposite. I think, again, common mistake, uh, people will talk about change the culture first, um, and then uh, the idea that this eventually leads to behavior change. Um, and I think it's much more effective to change what people do and allow that change to change what they believe. So effectively, um, it creates cognitive dissonance, and then they correct it by rationalizing why what they believe is different because they're what they're behaving is no longer consistent with what they believe. Uh, so to be clear, that means that we don't start with culture, which then changes values and attitudes and what people do. We start with what people do, which changes values and attitudes and then changes culture. So we kind of go the reverse. Um, part of this it comes, well, actually most of this comes from uh, John Shook's article on how the culture was changed at Numi, which was the GM Toyota partnership um, back in the day, um, and how that changed. Nui was the, uh, that particular factory was like the worst uh, factory in GM, and after about a year, it became the best. Um, and this was just how that happened. And again, that started from changing behavior uh, more so than changing culture, uh, first at least. Okay, uh, next idea, next strategy is starting with non-controversial problems and using visibility and reframing to make controversial problems non-controversial. So my general idea here is that um, one of the things you want to create um, is a sense of momentum. And the easiest way to create a sense of momentum is solve non-controversial problems first. Uh, because they are the problems that they don't get stuck while you're arguing about whether to solve them. People want to solve them. They get an improvement. It gives a sense of momentum. Um, and once you get a sense of momentum, more problems start to look non-controversial because the non solving the non-controversial problem usually starts to challenge um, pre-existing models or ways of thinking about things like what I mentioned before of the behavior starts to challenge the, what the beliefs are, which then starts making more problems non-controversial and you just start this uh, virtuous cycle. Um, to create um, ongoing momentum, which escalates the change. Uh, sometimes you may say, hey, but this problem we need to deal with isn't, con isn't non-controversial, um, so how do we get into the cycle? Um, and this is where you say, hey, let's try to do things, I mentioned before, the idea of visible models, so that people start saying, hey, wait a minute, this problem is real, um, or this problem is easier because you broke it down better, um, and what you broke it down to is non-controversial, and then you re-enter that virtuous cycle um, of momentum. Okay, final, final strategy is when nothing else seems to be working, you should look for exceptions. Um, I put or start there because you may also say, hey, I, I prefer, like, or there's advantage in just starting with the exceptions rather than trying to derive something. We just see what's already working and go there. And that's also a valid way to approach. I typically only do do this, though, when thing, nothing else is working. Um, but it's, it's a valid strategy just to start there. So uh, especially with a large organization or in a really tough situation, you, like everything might seem to be failing um, and there's nothing that's working. But that's almost never true. There's um, the kind of the phrase is no problem is perfect. Uh, so there's usually an exception, and if you can find it and find out what's different about that, you can kind of give you a step up uh, about what already is known to work within that context, and then uh, effectively just amplify it um, to, to solve, start getting some momentum again and start solving problems. So this idea comes from uh, multiple sources, but I think the best one here, uh, this book called, um, well, this concept called Positive De Deviance, which um, there's a book associated with that called The Power of Positive Deviance, um, which is essentially what I just said. So finding exceptions in tough situations in order to um, find some way forward when it's tough. Um, and that is uh, all the different strategies that I prefer
uh, for large scale change. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, I'm blown away. That was dynamite. So much condensed into this short talk. <laughs> wow. Uh, and thank you for being a guest and taking the time. Yeah, no problem. Uh, we never got the time to collaborate while we were at Spotify at roughly the same time. So I'm happy we're doing this now. I have a few questions, uh, follow-up questions. Sure, uh, sure. I could go down the route of asking for details of every single strategy, but th that then we'll be here for an hour. <laughs> so I have a little, some more general ones. So you gave a lot of advice on good strategies or potentially good strategies. Can you give examples of bad ones or stupid ones that you've never sure. seen fly or go wrong? Yeah, like I, I kind of alluded to a few of them um, when I was talking. Um, one, one, there's actually one we used to call the Mongol horde approach, um, where you just get hordes of people um, involved to try to change things. Um, typically uh, from the kind of air war concept of just educate everyone. Um, the other phrase, I think this is actually Australian, New Zealand thing called the sheep dip. Um, it, refers, it refers to, I think it's because of some kind of health reasons like you dip the back of a sheep in something. Um, I actually don't know. I don't know what this thing, you probably have to look it up, but it, it refers to very shallow education across the board, expecting mm. that to change things, which it doesn't. It's, yeah. this is very air war, um, much too, uh, like there's not enough um, given to people um, to, to allow them to succeed. The, yeah. This is kind of where I mentioned the idea of you do need to do things to help people feel involved and give them some kind of opportunity. But um, if you say, oh, that, I'll just do that and things will change, that's, that's very, that's sheep dip. That's, um, um, and it doesn't work. The, the Mongol horde thing tends to be associated with that because usually when people do like a whole horde of people coming in to try to change stuff, they're usually not targeted. Um, mm -hmm. um, and targeting matters a lot. Yeah. At least that was one of the kind of the main bad approaches. I also mentioned the idea of um, like, hey, if we just change how people, like what people believe and what they value, then that'll happen. Like one, you can't do that easily. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it all comes back down to air war only is probably a nice example of the very typical bad strategy. Yeah. And you hinted on the, the, uh, my follow-up question here. So I love the example you gave. I subscribe to the belief that uh, if you change how people do things, that would kind of slowly alter the attitudes about things and then eventually shape the culture. Um, these are all just uh, theoretical examples, but can you give a more concrete, practical examples of, of, example of where you've seen this happening, where changing how people what people do alters attitudes and then shapes culture. Yeah, like th this is, um, cause there's a lot of examples of this. Like back when I was at ThoughtWorks, it was kind of a typical approach we took. So you'd have a particular delivery um, and you would deliver it. Um, and then people would notice, and then they would notice that the particular approach taken was different um, and things they thought couldn't work did work. And then, then you start changing your, your behavior. Cause it's like, Oh, I didn't think this would work, but now that it worked, it's really hard to maintain that belief. Yeah. Like, because you could say, "Oh, I thought like the testing approach need to be a particular way that you should do it all at the end," and then you go, "But this thing, we did it. We did it differently. We did it up front. We kind of did the TDD type, like test room development type thing. We did the automation, and the result is significantly noticeably, like, in unarguably better. It's really hard to maintain the previous belief, but like, you just can't." Yeah. Um, yeah. nobody, typically people aren't that deluded. So then they go, oh, okay. And then it becomes, they start becoming advocates. And that happened a lot. That happened yeah. a lot. So, um, and I just generally go, okay, yeah, that's, that's how it is. Like the, it, it's kind of hard to, to, um, to, to convince people of that until they do it too. Cause even, even like meta, oh, but what do you mean? Like how, why would, how, why would people change their mind just by having them experience it and go, if you never experienced that too, it's kind of the meta thing, then it's hard for me to say, convince you too. You have to kind of do it and then you go, oh, wait a minute, that works really well. Yeah. Which actually bridged me to the last question. So talking about being convinced and, and seeing the real thing. So you mentioned that 
the importance or one strategy is to emphasize on uh, role modeling and the system and then uh, symbols the narrative and the yep. things we say are important and you mentioned that when there is a if you start with the symbols and start to start to tell the story of the, now this is important but the acts and reactions and behaviors of the leadership doesn't match uh, yep. well you have a you have a challenge right so can, can you elaborate a little bit more on that yeah, it's, I, I think, um, and it could be uh, cultural differences as well, but I think the perception of hypocrisy like really undermines trust. So um, like even if they said, hey, you're a bad leader, but you're consistent, like you just you straight up tell me you're, you're bad, then at least you know what you're into. But someone who says, hey, I'm a great person, and then they're bad, like their behavior is not consistent with that, I think you get worse. It, like the trust is even worse in that case because um, they don't believe anything you say anymore. Um, um, they think you're two-faced, that kind of thing. And I think that actually produces a worse thing. And this idea of like why well, kind of very wary of symbols first, air war for like that's incongruent is because that's what it's producing. Uh, people think, oh, this organization, these, these leaders are hypocritical. Um, they're not trustworthy and they check out or they like they really don't they really start disliking the organization. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's kind of like, uh, I think even more broadly, we see this now with um, some of the controversy in some of these kind of larger tech companies that um, it's not that, uh, it's because like people signed up for one thing because they believe the narrative and then they got something else and then now they're really annoyed. Yeah. Um, if they if you told them, you know, hey, we're not we're not pretending to be, great people this is just what we do then people sign up for that you can actually get away with that yeah uh, well if, once again Jason thank you so much for taking the time I have in my head a long list of follow-up questions and I want to pick your brain but hopefully uh, there will be a time for that later um, yeah people can just add comments and I can reply to them as well yes so it's fine um, maybe I'll try to invite you to this a patreon meetup later for, for a QA. We'll see. Uh, stick around and subscribe and you'll get alerted. All right, Jason, take care and have a great day. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> What's your experience of large-scale agile transformations? What strategies do you prefer when leading change? Please discuss and comment below. If you enjoy these videos and want to support my work of creating free educational and hopefully entertaining videos here on YouTube, please consider becoming a Patreon. And to my current Patreons, you are the best, and your support means everything to me. If you have a tip for me on who to invite to do a guest talk for a future episode, please comment below. And until next time, explore, have fun, and be safe.